Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Noelle Swan. I am the Science, Technology, and Environment Editor at the Christian Science Monitor, and I am joined today by my colleague, Monitor Science Writer Owen O'Carroll. We are both really pleased to be here today. This is our first time at the Boston Book Festival. We both spend most of our time immersed in science news, but we do have colleagues at the Monitor who uh, put together a very robust book section. So before we get started with today's program, I just want to make sure everyone spotted their yellow bookmarks on their chair. This includes an invitation to subscribe to our free books newsletter, which includes book reviews, author news, and information about events just like this one. But today, we are so glad to be here to introduce you all to Professor Alan Lightman. And uh, so Alan is a man of science as a uh, theoretical physicist, but throughout his whole life, he has always kind of strayed from the sciences into areas that are often more considered arts and humanities. Even as a, uh, as a postdoctoral fellow in astrophysics, he started uh, publishing poetry as well. And soon he ended up at MIT, where he is now, as a professor of both science and writing. I understand you're the first professor there to share that, uh, that particular post. He has been described as the poet laureate of science writing, and his novel, the 1992 novel, Einstein's Dreams, has been hailed as a modern classic. He's joined us today to talk about one of his most recent books, Searching for Stars on an Island in Maine. It's a meditation on the interconnections and tensions between science and spirituality. And that's an area that we don't often get to delve into very much on the Monitor Science Desk, and it's really been kind of a treat for the two of us, wouldn't you say, Owen? Uh, yeah, what, what I love about this book is it asks the, the deepest, oldest questions. Um, the questions of uh, what is the ground of existence? Where, what, is the, what is the reality ultimately made of? And that's an ancient question. Uh, the first philosophers, uh, uh, Thales, uh, was, uh, uh, answered that it was the universe was made of water. Um, he might not have been right. Pythagoras said it was made of numbers. Uh, Democritus said it was made of little indestructible particles called atoms. Plato said it was made of ideas. And modern science, well, it says that it's made of matter and maybe laws. And it, it, uh, Alan's book addresses, uh, grapples with that, this question that you're never really going to answer, maybe not, uh, uh, maybe not with f fully satisfactorily, but the questions that it spawns, and the questions that those questions spawn end up leading to science and, uh, and uh, all, the, all the technological wonders that surround us. And so I think it's, it's a perennial book um, and, and, and a way that uh, uh, a lot of even uh, pop, pop philosophy books are not. That's great. Well, Searching for Stars has really resonated with our readers uh, at the Monitor as well. For this past week, our subscribers have been sending us questions to ask Dr. Lightman, and we're going to get to them soon, and we'll get to some of your questions as well. But what has also come in has been some of these personal stories that we didn't really expect. And some of our readers have been talking about having their own sort of accounts, uh, they're offering accounts of these transcendental and almost mystical experiences that they have had while gazing at the stars. And that is really a central theme in your book, right? And so I wonder, you, you have a story in there that the entire book really hinges on. I wonder if you could tell us just to start a little bit about that experience. Okay, well, I've been asked to read a little section of the book. Uh, about my transcendent experience. Uh, I've had many, so I'm just going to read a little passage from the book. <clears throat> I lay down in the boat and looked up. A very dark night sky seen from the ocean is a mystical experience. After a few minutes, my world had dissolved into that star-littered sky. The boat disappeared, my body disappeared, and I found myself falling into infinity. A feeling came over me I had not experienced before, perhaps a sensation experienced by the ancients at Fonte Gom. I felt an overwhelming connection to the stars as if I were part of them. 
and the vast expanse of time extending from the far distant past long before I was born to the far distant future long after I would be dead seemed compressed to a dot. I felt connected not only to the stars but to all of nature and to the entire cosmos. I felt emerging with something far larger than myself, a grand and eternal unity, a hint of something absolute. Well, we got a couple of questions from our readers about that particular experience and what effect that has had on your life afterward. Um, aside from inspiring you to write this book and to ask these questions, have you found that it has sort of changed the way you view the world? Well, uh, before I answer the question, yeah. uh, which I will, um, I just wanted to say that, that the book as a whole is a, is a, a personal struggle on how um, I have tried to, to reconcile the material with the immaterial. That as a scientist, I believe that the world is, is all material, but um, I also recognize uh, that there are experiences uh, that cannot be quantified, cannot be reducible by science. And the, the transcendent experience that I described just now in the reading are, are other experiences that might, one might call spiritual experiences uh, represent another way of being in the world. Uh, so that's the, the, the struggle that I deal with in, in the book. Um, now to the question. So the question is, did this, this experience uh, of suddenly falling into infinity and just sort of seeing all of these connections, uh, has it carried over into other parts of your life? Has it yes. changed the way you view the world? Yes, certainly. And, and I've had many experiences of this type, and I'm sure I would imagine that many of you have as well. Um, I think the experience affects me as, as a human being. Um, not necessarily as, as a scientist, but I think that, that we, we are capable of, of both science and art. Um, we, we, we do experiments and we also experience the world. And uh, as, as a human being, um, I want to be open to these kinds of experiences uh, even if I can't quantify them. Uh, when I had that experience in the boat looking up at the sky, you could have connected every one of my 100 billion neurons to a, to a computer and, and read out the electrical impulse from, from all of them, and you still would not have been able to understand the experience, this feeling of, of being connected to something larger than myself. Uh, but paradoxically, I remain a materialist. I, I remain committed to the material world. So it's this, this tension uh, between the material and the immaterial that is uh, that's part of my life and I imagine of, of many of yours and, and fuels my creativity and my excitement about being alive in the world. Oh, and you had a question along the lines of materialism, didn't you? Uh, yeah, um, and it's, it speaks to what you just said. Uh, there's this great passage in your book, um, a sentence you say, uh, the materiality of the world is a fact, but facts don't explain experience. Um, and uh, one of the greatest challenges in recent years to the uh, philosophical doctrine of materialism has been what's called the consciousness problem, which is uh, just what Alan said here, is that if you have all the facts of an experience, and if you know all those facts, is that the same thing as knowing what it's like to have that experience? Or does there exist an explanatory gap uh, between those two? Uh, put another way, we can ask ourselves, what is it like to be a bat or a cat or an elephant? Um, and we may not ever know what it's like to be such a thing, but it's meaningful in a way that we, uh, uh, in the way that the question, what is it like to be a brick, is not. Mm -hmm. So why is it? that matter has a point of view? Why is it that these interactions between an organism and its environment are sometimes accompanied by experience? Uh, well, I, I think that, although I think that our, our consciousness uh, 
our, our sense of, of awareness, uh, our ego, our, our I-ness is, is rooted in the material brain being a materialist. Um, I think the, the brain is made of atoms and molecules and nothing more. Uh, I think that the, the experience of consciousness uh, happens at a much higher level. And uh, simply knowing that it is rooted in a material brain does not uh, explain it or the sensation of consciousness. Uh, I don't know whether that's uh, an answer. I, I do think that, that, that uh, consciousness and uh, self-awareness and asking questions about what is the meaning of our lives, what is the meaning of the cosmos, uh, the creation of art, all of these things are byproducts of having a high intelligence. And the high intelligence uh, has survival benefit. Um, we, we can't outrun a saber-toothed tiger, but we can outsmart it sometimes. Uh, so, so I think there's a clear survival benefit for developing advanced intelligence. And then there are byproducts, um, just like uh, even though the, 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 that intelligence was not designed for the creation of art, was not designed for asking uh, larger questions, uh, does God exist? Would we be happier if we lived a thousand years uh, many interesting questions like that. Um, those questions, the search for meaning, the creation of art, uh, all of the, the higher levels of existence that come with consciousness are a byproduct of having higher intelligence. Uh, and and it's, there are many things that, that many objects that, that do things that they weren't designed for. Uh, uh, you can use a hammer as a paperweight, uh, even though it wasn't designed to be a paperweight, you can use it for a paperweight. And so I, I think that, that, that Mother Nature, uh, through the process of evolution, may have designed our, our, our brains uh, with high intelligence for survival benefit, that all of these other wonderful things that are associated with the human imagination, the human experience, or byproducts of that higher intelligence. And I don't think that it's only in Homo sapiens either. I think there's a continuum going down to amoebas. Uh, I don't think amoebas have a great self-awareness, uh, but uh, I don't think that it's, it's an all or nothing with Homo sapiens. Well, I imagine we have some folks in the audience here who are familiar with some of your earlier works as well. And your perhaps best known book, uh, Einstein's Dreams, it's this fictional illustration of Einstein's theory of relativity. It's a series of vignettes that kind of put skin and bone on the idea that uh, time is relative. So in one universe, time is cyclical, in another it flows backward, and in each one of these uh, realms, the lived experience is very different depending on that. So the reader is kind of left with this idea that all of these things are possible all at once at any time. So then you fast forward to searching for stars, and it seems to me that there's just this very different theme that recurs through it again and again. And as you're kind of chronicling this personal quest for something immutable, some sort of absolute, and whether that's some kind of divinity or some physical laws, it seems like you're really looking for something to be able to just hold on to. And um, just some firm order of the universe that you can kind of trust to remain constant, right? And so those feel like such very different uh, quests to me. So I wonder, what was that evolution like? I mean, obviously, there's a, a good span of time between these two books. Um, Einstein's Dream was from 1992. And so is, do, you, do you see much distinction? Is this a natural evolution of thought for you? How did you go from point A to point B? 
Well, I, I think of Einstein's dreams as, as a book about the creative process in science mm -hmm. and, and, and the flight of the imagination. Um, I could not have written, and I wrote the book when I was in my late 30s um, or around that time. Um, I could not have written the book Searching for Stars on an Island in Maine at that phase of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I needed to live a lot longer and experience more and understand more about what was meaningful to me. And, and, and uh, so uh, that, that, was, that, that could not have been written earlier. So in terms of what was the evolution, the evolution is simply that I lived longer <laughs> and, and uh, uh, I think the longer that you live, the more questions you have about the world. And, so it's a product and, of maturation. And, yeah, it's a product of maturation. Um, uh, what, what has meaning for, for yourself and your society and I don't think that uh, many 20-year-olds ask questions like that. Uh, and as you get older, we, we begin wondering what it all m means and thinking about the, the bad turns we've taken in life and so on. So it's, it's a book that represents more maturity. Right. Have you let go of that sense that all things are possible? Or do you still no, hold cer on to that? No, certainly not. Uh, I think we continue hoping. Um, although, when you get older, there, there are certain options that are closed off to you. Sure. I mean, I'm not going to run a four-minute mile uh, <laughs> at, at my age. But anyway, uh, but uh, I, I think that, 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 that things open up to you in your imagination. That, that were, were not present when you were 20 years old. And, and your imagination is a world of its own and can continue opening doors forever. That, that is a nice thought. <laughs> I like that. Did you want to ask something? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's quite in line of, uh, of what we were talking about, but I think it might stimulate more uh, further questions. Um, at the end of the chapter titled Truth, you propose kind of a truce between science and religion um, by, pr by saying that, well, you know, as, as many people in the audience know, science and religion have often been in conflict, uh, not just over evolution, but over uh, uh, lots, of other, uh, uh, lots of other things that come into clash. And so you suggested a way of, of kind of uh, proposing a piece where uh, if something happens in the physical universe, uh, then it must have a physical explanation, but that doesn't preclude the possibility of believing in non-physical entities. Yes. Um, it's a little bit like, uh, it reminds me of Stephen Jay Gold's uh, non-overlapping magisteria, mm -hmm. um, except it's prescriptive instead of a description of what's actually happening. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that peace treaty that you're proposing? Yeah, well, uh, I, I think that, the, that, that all statements about the physical universe, um, even statements in the sacred books or uh, statements by religious institutions um, have to be subject to uh, analysis by science and uh, have to be subject to experimental tests and rejected if found to disagree with evidence. And uh, I think the physical world is the province of science, uh, whereas uh, everything else and I do think that there's something else uh, is the province of spirituality or religion. And for me, spirituality is a very personal uh, experience. Um, and I'm not talking about organized religion, but I'm talking about uh, this, this very vital, immediate feeling of being connected to something larger than ourselves as I described in that short reading I gave. And uh, uh, no one can deny the validity of a transcendent experience that you've had. Uh, the authority of that experience rests in the experience itself. 
whereas uh, in the physical world, uh, in the world of science, uh, phenomena have to be tested and repeated and reproduced in many different laboratories before they are accepted. So it's a very different process of, of authority and of, of, of proof. Well, perhaps following on that question, you know, you, you, talk, you, you, share, you spoke about one other thing that struck me as interesting as being shared between the realms of, of science and spirituality, and that, that is the idea of faith. And uh, so we all, I think everyone would, would agree that faith is a big part of any spirituality or religion. However, you suggest that it's also a component of science as well, that you have to have faith. Yes. And that, that to me was a very new idea. Could you share that? Yes. Um, well, most scientists don't talk about faith and science. Um, it, it's sort of uh, antagonistic to the whole project of science um, where everything has to be tested and confirmed by experiment and rejected if found to not to agree. But there is one idea that's very central to science which we do have to take on faith and that's something I call the central doctrine of science. And the central doctrine of science is that the physical world is lawful. That is, everything in the physical world obeys laws and rules like the fact that energy is conserved and those rules are ultimately discoverable by human beings. And, and the laws and rules hold everywhere in the universe at all times. And that's a, a doctrine that we, that we have to take on faith. We can't prove it because no matter what laws we have now to describe the physical world, we can never be certain that tomorrow we might, not, we might observe some phenomena that violates those laws and, and even in principle is not des describable by laws. But every graduate student in science um, learns the central doctrine of science. You can't do science without it without believing that the world is lawful. If, if, if miracles were happening right and left, if that table right there suddenly started floating in the air and there was no explanation for it, you, you couldn't do science. So scientists, science requires commitment to believing that the world is lawful. It's a commitment that cannot be proven and therefore it's something that we, we take on, on faith. So uh, th there are some things that, that science takes on faith. And it's not just that the universe is lawful, but that these laws can be reduced to ever smaller laws. Because um, right now we're dealing with kind of a patchwork, right? If I were to um, throw a penny off the stage, uh, maybe New Newtonian uh, classical mechanics would be the best place to uh, figure out where that penny would land. If I were to drop a dollar bill, you might switch to fluid dynamics to figure out yeah. where we go. If I were to do a hundred dollar bill, then maybe the behavioral sciences would uh, <laughs> uh, be the best to, to uh, find out where it ends up. But the, 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 uh, the scientists have it on faith that uh, e each one of those uh, can be reduced, that uh, yes, we might use psychology, but it's really just biochemistry, and we might say, and it really kind of gets reduced down to mathematics, and at least in theory, you'd be able to use the standard model of, of physics yeah, to uh, predict right. every interaction. That, that's, that's right. So um, some, uh, the way I view science the, uh, is, is over the, the centuries since Galileo and, and earlier, is that it, it's, it's a process of ever more accurate approximations to the way the world behaves. Uh, Newton's theory of gravity very beautifully described the orbits of planets for two centuries, and then in the 1800s, we, we, with very good telescopes, we found that the, 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 the planet Mercury had an orbit which slightly disagreed with the predictions of Newton's theory, and so we knew that it ultimately had to be replaced, and in 1915, Einstein replaced Newton's theory with a new theory of gravity, um, uh, which explained Mercury and many other phenomena, 
And we know that Einstein's theory will have to be replaced ultimately because it does not include quantum. And this is the way that I view science as, as better and better approximations. There, there are some scientists who think that there is a final theory of nature, a final set of laws and equations which do not need any further approximation, that are exact, that need no further revision. Uh, Steven Weinberg, uh, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, calls that the final theory. And uh, some physicists believe there is a final theory. Some physicists think that no, it, it's, it's going to be an infinite progression of, of, of better approximations. The, the wonderful irony about this is that even if we had a final theory, we were in possession of this magical 17 equations that describe everything perfectly, we wouldn't know that we had it. Because you can never be certain that tomorrow there might not be a new phenomena that disagrees with your 17 equations and shows that they're incomplete or only approximations. So uh, we'll never know if we have the final theory. So this is also something that you have to have faith in if you believe it, that there is a final theory. Well. I do want to make sure that we take some time for the audience to ask questions. And it, it looks like, do I already have some folks queued up? Or uh, we have two microphones. We have one down front on this side over here and one in the back uh, on this side as well. So maybe uh, we'll ask another question and if you uh, over up here. And if, but if you feel so inclined to step, just step on up and we'll give you a shout out. Did you want to ask something? Well, let's go to the audience. Okay. One right, right here. Oh, up. there we go, right here. Is this on? Hi, hi, hi. So here we are. Um, if indeed uh, atoms progressed from hydrogen through noble gases like argon to carbons and then produced us, you're saying that uh, survival, the is, was the main reason why we were able to um, produce all these theories and uh, move science forward. I'm curious about curiosity, how that plays into uh, the way we move things forward and where that comes from. About 40 years ago, I took a class in phenomenology so we were thinking about where are ideas, where are our sites, where are our um, uh, feelings. And it came down to curiosity. And I was wondering why humans have that. You're talking about survival, so that's uh, action reaction. And we build up a, a, a method of reacting. Mm -hmm. But where does curiosity come in? Well, uh, I would argue, first of all, this wonderful comment that you make in question. Um, um, it's not only Homo so sapiens that has curiosity. Yes, a cat can have move forward. Yes, we, we can see a, a, a lot of animals that have curiosity as well. And I think that curiosity does have survival benefit. Um, uh, if you see... A, a, a tail sticking out from under a chair or a rock, then it would be uh, of survival benefit to know whether that tail was part of, of a rat or uh, a large, ferocious tiger. Um, so um, I, I do think that curiosity has survival benefit, and I think it's associated with uh, our high, high intelligence, and I think that we can see it uh, throughout the animal kingdom, at least in, in the higher animals. But it's, it's a wonderful uh, question to ask about curiosity, and uh, that does seem to be one of the, the, the earmarks of, of higher intelligence. I think, that's, I think that's what made you fall into the stars <laughs> yeah. that night on the boat. We have a question back here. Good morning. One of the things that I'm curious about, and I'm sure some other people are too, is the afterlife. 
And a, a materialist, of course, would say, you know, when, when we're done, we're done, and our atoms go off to the universe, and who knows where they go. And, but I'm wondering, Professor Lightman, whether you, uh, in your fertile imagination, can envision a scenario where those atoms and molecules somehow come back together via some strange form of quantum entanglement or whatever it might be uh, to, to provide consciousness in a, in a non-body form. Is that something mm -hmm. you think about much? Well, um, you may know more about the afterlife than I do. Um, <laughs> uh, but my understanding of the afterlife and, and the, the various religious traditions that have a concept of, of some life after physical death do not have the uh, eternal soul or whatever it is in material form. So your, your postulate that maybe the, the atoms come back together to form consciousness is a, is a material version of, of the afterlife, which I have not heard before, and, and I, I don't think exists in most of the religious traditions. Uh, but I will give you my personal view, um, which is only my view since none of us know whether there is an afterlife or not. Uh, I do not believe in an afterlife in the, in the, in the normal sense of things. Um, I think that our, our bodies are made of atoms and molecules and nothing more, and I think that uh, and they're in a special arrangement to allow for, for neurons and consciousness, and then when we die, that special arrangement disassembles and we lose our consciousness uh, and are never conscious again. But there's an asterisk to that, and that is that there is a sense in which we continue, and it's not only in the memories of our children and grandchildren, but our actual atoms remain. Um, atoms don't disintegrate, they remain. And if I could put my social security number on every one of my atoms, <laughs> I could follow it for a thousand, follow them all for a thousand years. Somebody could follow them for a thousand years. And some of my atoms would, would go, uh, would be dissolved into the ocean. Some of them would float around in the air. Some of them would be absorbed by plants and animals. And some of my atoms, a thousand years from now, will be parts of other people and parts of other memories. And even 10,000 years from now, many of my atoms will be still on Earth in various forms, parts of other people. And in that way, I have a, a, a long-lasting presence beyond my physical death. And so that's how uh, someone who is, a, well, I call myself a, a spiritual materialist. Uh, and that's how a, 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 a spiritual materialist looks at her own death, his own death. For the record, you stole my question. <laughs> but uh, I have another question right here. Um, I. Um, believe in the humanities, and many higher education institutions are trying to get science, people studying science, and people in the humanities together. In the University of Michigan, my, uh, I'm an alum, they're putting the music students next to the scientists. What do you feel the humanities have to offer people who want to think deep thoughts, such as you? Well, uh, uh, I, I, of course, I mean, I'll say something that, that I think everybody agrees with, that the humanities are extremely important and uh, being a human being and providing values. Uh, science and technology do not have values on their own. It's, it's we human beings that give them values. And uh, we need the humanities to, to help guide us to, 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 to offer those, 
those values. Um, I, I, I do know that, that, that many universities are creating interdisciplinary programs so that, that the sciences and the humanities can talk to each other, and that's, that's very important. Uh, I think they should still remain distinct disciplines because you learn different kinds of tools and ways of thinking in the sciences and the humanities, just like we wouldn't want to homogenize all of the, the different languages on Earth because we get a richness from that diversity. But I do think that, uh, that the interdisciplinary uh, efforts are, are very, very worthwhile and, and help counterbalance the, the trend of specialization that's been going on uh, in the academy for the last 500 years. We got one particular question from a subscriber that was from a mom. Do you have that one in there? Let's see. There it is. Uh, it, I, I think would be a nice follow-up to that okay. question. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's from a monitor subscriber. Uh, what advice would you give to the mother of a 15-year-old freshman? This is a very specific question. What advice would you give to the mother of a 15-year-old freshman who is interested in both ballet and math and possibly astrophysics? Mom is trying to give access to opportunities that enrich her mind while she trains her body. Well, m my advice uh, would be to encourage all of those interests. And I think uh, that, that at a young age that, that many of us have interests in both the sciences and the arts. And our teachers and our parents and our friends discourage that multidisciplinary interest uh, because life is easier if, you're, if you go one way or the other, if you're, if you're either the, the rational type of person or the intuitive person, if you're either the deliberate kind of person or the spontaneous person. Uh, so uh, I think that, uh, that, that we should fight against those, those pressures uh, at home and among our friends and schools and that, that we should encourage young people who have uh, multidisciplinary interests to follow as many of them as possible. At some, at some point of your education, you need to get very well grounded in at least one thing. Uh, I, I don't think a person should be a jack of all trades from a young age. So you do need to get well grounded in uh, in one particular discipline at some point of your education. But uh, I believe that that we should encourage our young people to pursue all of their interests, uh, certainly at that age. Did you ever get pushback for your poetry? Did anyone tell you that that was a distraction? Yes. Uh, what you do? Did it, did you take it to heart at, at any point, um, or were you kind of always steadfast? No, I need this. This is part of me. Well, I felt I, I needed it um, when I was uh, in high school. And looking back on, I see this more clearly. I didn't at the time. I had two groups of friends. I had my science type friends uh, who did the science projects um, and were good at math and tried to give logical, rational arguments for everything. And then I had my art friends who wrote for the, the literary magazine and, and uh, were more intuitive. And uh, I enjoyed being with both groups of people. And uh, I didn't think there was anything unusual about it. And I, I believe that we should en encourage our children to have both groups of friends. All right. We've got some, another question back here. Thank you. Um, this is also kind of a follow-up. I was intrigued that your professional post involves the practice of humanities. And I'm wondering how that changed your teaching and how you teach your students to practice and not just learn about the humanities. Yes. Well. The, the, the title uh, is, is a little misleading, Professor of the Practice of the Humanities. Uh, when I first went to MIT, I was jointly in the physics department and in the humanities areas. Um, about 10 years ago, I resigned my professorship at 
at MIT my, and my tenure because uh, all of the, the commitments of a, of a tenured professor at the university, um, all of the committee meetings that you have to go to and so on, uh, did not leave me time to pursue my other interests, uh, my, my writing and, and my uh, nonprofit work. And so um, at many universities, if you have someone with the rank of professor but who is not a tenured uh, professor, that is, they've given up their, their tenure, uh, that means they're, 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 they're no longer permanently hired at the university. Their title changes to professor of the practice of blank. So it, it, it doesn't mean that I'm a greater practitioner of the humanities than, <laughs> than any of you or anybody else, but it just means it just represents, it's, it's sort of a technical term, meaning that I no longer have a permanent position. Um, I hate going to committee meetings. <laughs> and uh, I've only no been one likes to. Those. <laughs> so um, I, I just thought that I wanted to use my time in a different way. True. You mentioned your nonprofit work. Uh, you were telling us a little bit uh, before we climbed up here on stage about uh, some work that you've been doing in Southeast Asia. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, well, about 15 years ago, um, I, uh, and this may not be of interest to everyone here, but I, I went to uh, Southeast Asia for the first time to Cambodia, and I was inspired by a woman there to begin working on uh, empowering young women uh, from the countries of Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, since then, I've been working uh, to build uh, dormitories, provide educational uh, opportunities, to provide programs and leadership and critical thinking for, for young women. Uh, so I've been going there twice a year for the last 15 years. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the work. It's All right. Well, that's, that's great to hear about. I want to get to some more questions as well. I think we have some over here. I'm a teacher, I teach writing in a middle school, and I'm also a parent of two young men who are now both in college. And my question is, with our advances in technology and science, is there any concern that we're losing that intelligence for the ability to create and be artistic? And the reason I ask is based on my observation that my students, which are uh, like 10 to 13, 14, are super overscheduled, they're super screen connected, and I'm generalizing, but I had a 13-year-old boy tell me a couple days ago he had never seen a firefly. And I have 10-year-olds who I gave in a writing, writing assignment to yesterday in class, and I said, and they were stumped and looking at the blank page, I said, come on, use your imagination. And these 10-year-olds were staring at me blank, like I have no imagination. And I think the days of, like when I was a kid, you know, you went outside and you played with a stick and a dirt. And, you know, you, you ran around and you built forts and used yeah. your imagination. And you learned creativity through play. And my concern, and I'm, my question is, do you share this as well, is that kids are losing their mm -hmm. ability to have an imagination and to create, to think creatively. Yeah. Well, I totally agree with you, and I don't, I don't think that the culprit here is, is more emphasis on science and technology. I think the culprit is the modern lifestyle that we're living, which is high-speed, frenzy, mm -hmm. hyper-connectedness, mm -hmm. uh, having a screen in front of you all the time, and studies have been sh done to show that the creativity among young people has actually began decreasing, decreasing in 1995 when the internet became widespread. Uh, there's a, a standard test called the Torrance Test of Creativity, which has been given for 50 years and longer. And uh, according to this test, creativity has been decreasing among young people. And most uh, psychologists and sociologists associate this with the rise of the internet and, and the feeling of being hyper-connected. 
uh, our, our smartphones uh, and our computers uh, are uh, interfering with our direct experience with the world. You see people going on walks in the woods and they're looking at their smartphone instead of looking around them. You see people at restaurants who are texting and, and uh, this is a, a very serious problem. Um, uh, I wrote another book about this problem called, <laughs> called The Value of, uh, I mean, In Praise of Wasting Time. And uh, I think we're des destroying our, our, our mental health, our, our, our ability to, to, to actually experience the world directly. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, I think it's as, it's, as, it's as serious as the environmental damage being done by global warming, which is much more visible. But the invisible destruction of our mental world I believe is, is just a serious yeah, and a the problem. And, the, and I agree with you wholeheartedly, unfortunately. And the flip side of that is the increase of mental health issues that I see in the classroom right. have skyrocketed right. in, in those same 10 years. Yes, the Thank increase you. in mental health problems. Yep. Uh, yeah, this kind of uh, presages the, the next question um, about in praise of wasting time. Uh, do you think that uh, that it's harming science, uh, that uh, if, if people spend too much time looking at screens, there's less time looking at the stars and the, and the trees. Is it harming science? Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's harming all aspects of our imagination. And since science is one of the activities that we do with our imagination, I think, yes, it's harming science. Uh, we, we need vast, open, silent spaces in our mind uh, where we can let our minds wander and we're not, where we're not constantly being interrupted by the outside world. And uh, many studies have shown that, that the creative imagination needs those open spaces of silence where we're not being disturbed by external stimulation. I, I think we're, we're addicted to constant external stimulation now. And that's part of what the, the smartphone enables. Right. And I'm not <clears throat> anti-technology in general. I think that technology has been a great thing. But we have to use it wisely. Well, we're probably going to get interrupted with some external stimulation soon. Uh, so we're going to run out of time. So before we take our last question, we have one more. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone to take your yellow bookmarks with you, sign up for the Monitor's Books newsletter, and also you're welcome to join our Books Beat Facebook page where Monitor book reviewers, staffers chat with readers about books. Uh, but we'll just take one more question. There's a gentleman right here who's been waiting very patiently. Thank you. Uh, I had a question uh, which... Well, I guess it's a, re a reflection I'd like to share with you about the doctrine of science. I happen to be a scientist, actually a PhD scientist from MIT. But uh, it is about the doctrine of science. And I think you might have implied it, but I think it is one part of this idea that there is a, there is a perfect theory uh, is that we as humans can understand that theory. In other words, the human limitation to me is a larger uh, doctrine assumption, doctrinaire assumption, than that there is some unity. There may be, may not be, but as you say, we'll never know it. But the hubris, I think the element of hubris here, and that is what is, I think, rampantly, you know, these problems fundamentally uh, seem to me to arise out of that hubris, that it's okay to do anything as long as it's smart, as long as uh, you know, it's advancing the course of your narrow specialization. I think this is, to me, the doctrinaire, uh, the fundamental doc doctrine of uh, So, So you science. think that it's, it's arrogance to, <clears throat> if I understand you right, it's arrogant of us to think that we can understand these laws? I would put it a little more softly. That Hubris. You, 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 well. need, you need humility. You need humility. Yes. And I find it singularly lacking as the culture evolves. Uh, in science. Well, I, I think that, that science has a fair amount of humility because we recognize that uh, 
that science is, is a process of constant revision. And that's where our humility comes in. Uh, I, I don't think that it's arrogant to believe that, that the human mind is, is, is capable of ultimately understanding the laws. Uh, you know, if, 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 we, if we take that point of view, then we're, we're back in, uh, in Milton's Paradise Lost. Uh, Adam asked the archangel Gabriel, uh, how do the heavens, the orbits of the planets work? And, and the archangel replies, there's some issues that uh, are in the province of, of the, the divine and, and, and humans shouldn't be asking about those questions. So, so we need to keep asking the questions. And if we thought that there were areas of knowledge, and I'm talking about the physical world now, if we thought there were areas of, of knowledge of the physical world, there were, there were off limits to human beings, uh, then uh, that would be very, very bad for science. But, but you're, I agree completely. We, we need to, to maintain a certain amount of humility and, and, and realize that, that science is a process of, of, of constant revision, and we need to constantly test our, our beliefs against experiment. Yeah, I did not mean that we should not explore. I think we should explore with the idea that this is a kind of an endless progression, which is a wonderful progression. Yeah. And I think that might have a different sort of tone to what we do in science. It, it could be an endless progression. And as I said earlier, there's some physicists who believe there is a final theory, and we will eventually have it on our grass, although we won't know when we have it. And there are other scientists, and maybe your, yourself is in this camp, who believe that there is no final theory, that, 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 that it's just an infinite progression of better and better approximations. Um, that's a, a philosophical question really, because it's one that we won't know the answer to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to tell us just a, quickly about what, uh, what your next project is? Uh, well, my next project, uh, which is completely different from what we've talked about, is a, a novel about a Cambodian farming family. And I've, I've been going to Cambodia now for 15 years and finally felt like I was beginning to understand the culture well enough to, to write fiction about it. So that's the current book. All righty. Does it have a title yet? It has a title. It's called Three Flames. Okay. We will keep our eyes out for that. All righty. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time. And, uh, but I really want to thank, first of all, Monitor Science writer Owen O'Carroll for joining me today and helping to facilitate. And I'm hoping everyone here will join in a big round of applause, thanking Professor Alan Lightman. <laughs> and I believe there will be some book signing happening in the back of the room as well. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs>